Welcome to the Off Central Podcast. Here. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We are ready for part two with Dad. Pastor Peter Fotheru in the house. Thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. I say us. I'm used to having Larry here, but he's not here. Thank you for joining me. <laughs> Pastor Larry is uh, is enjoying some R&R with his uh, family. So uh, yeah, you stuck with me again today. I'm happy about that. And uh, we're going to dive into it today. Um, as promised last week, I thought it'd be really interesting to discuss. Um, well, why don't I start with a quote and then I'll jump into what we're going to discuss. This is from C.S. Lewis. He says, uh, failures are the finger posts on the road to achievement. And uh, you can't go wrong with the C.S. Lewis quote to start with. No, it's brilliant. <laughs> he, he is brilliant. Um, and I thought it'd be interesting to talk about success and failure. Um, it's one of the things obviously every human being has to navigate and learn to navigate hopefully well mm -hmm. <laughs> with grace and maturity. Um, mm -hmm. But it's also really difficult at times. But but before we get into maybe how you have navigated some failure excess or helped others navigate through some really difficult things as a pastor mm -hmm. um, or as a friend, as a mentor, um, maybe we could start with how should we think about success? How should we think about failure? Because the secular mm. world defines it in a certain way, usually right. by, you know, success is defined by how much we accumulate, how many friends do we have on Instagram, how many followers do we have, how many people adore us, like us, whatever it is, it's usually some sort of accumulation of wealth and fame mm -hmm. added together in some cocktail, or, and maybe there's a component of deep spiritual growth there as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and failure is determined in certain ways as well. Um, but how should, we, how should we think about biblical success? How should we think mm. about biblical failure? What does it mean to succeed as an apprentice of Jesus? Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. If you look at the dictionary definition of failure, it says a lack of success, <laughs> <laughs> which is not very helpful. Right? It's like it, yeah, it's like it's just telling it's, me what it's not. Yes, it's defined by the other word. Yeah. <laughs> it's oh, not funny. this. Yeah, yeah, that's helpful. But exactly. So yeah. it doesn't say what it is, and I think there's. I think you. I think failure is such a big word. Um, I think there's two ways of looking at it. There's what I would call moral failure, which is, which is something we all encounter in terms of we don't live up to our own expectations of who we should be and what we should do. Mm. And, and this is Paul's, you know, I do the things yeah. I don't want to do. This is Romans 7. I, Romans 7, and I don't yeah. do the things yeah. I know I should do. Exactly. A wretched man that I have. <laughs> <laughs> Which is quite a revelation coming from yeah. Paul. What hope is there for us? <laughs> well, the, the, I mean, the great thing about, if we're honest with moral failure, is it, it it's meant to drive us to the grace of God. It's meant to drive us to the one who provides redemption and forgiveness and restoration. So so there's a sort of a category of failure in life, which is which is us coming to the realization that even at our best, we're not fulfilling our deepest desires and longings, even for ourselves, if we're honest. But then there's but then there's another category of failure, and it's called failure, but I don't think it's a great word because it doesn't give us a framework for learning and experimentation. And so, for instance, when a child is learning to ride a bike, you could say every time it falls off, it's failed. You, mm -hmm. you could look at it through that paradigm. Because the goal is to ride the bike. Right. And if you fall, you're not doing that. Exactly. Hence failure is easy to jump to that. Yeah. But perhaps a better way of saying is... Um, he didn't get it right that time. Mm -hmm. And and it's just about learning and about continuing until he does get it right. And, and so we do that all the time in life. We, we do that when we learn to drive a car. You know, a, a, a good instructor doesn't turn around to the student after every lesson and say, well, you failed several times on this thing. He says, you've got to practice this. Mm -hmm. He frames it positively. Um, you've got to pay attention to this. You've got to focus on this. And that is 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 quite visionary, actually, mm -hmm. in the communication. 
so instead of sort of looking at the past, it's learning from the past mm -hmm. in a way to point towards something better in the future. In fact, it's fascinating. In the 1990s in the UK, they developed uh, a whole series of vocational qualifications that at that time were called National Vocational Qualifications. And the idea was that you would there would be underpinning knowledge and theory that you would have to learn, which was the book learning part of it. But then there was the skill and the practice of what you did. And I actually became an NVQ assessor. I, I, I got the qualification. And as an NVQ assessor, you would ask people questions about their underpinning knowledge, but then you would observe them in practice, in place. So for instance, if they were a sales assistant, you would be with them on the job, watching how they dealt with a customer. And as an NVQ assessor, you, you, you looked at the criteria for how they were meant to behave in that particular scenario, and you looked at the underpinning knowledge. And if, if they had them, you, you, you simply declared you're competent. And if they didn't do it and they didn't achieve all the standards you were looking for, you simply said, not yet competent. You didn't say incompetent. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not just semantics. No, it's not just semantics. It's very clever and very powerful because it, it left the person with the feeling, I need to go away and practice more. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what it's like when you're learning to drive a car. You know, the instructor, am I ready yet? You need a few more lessons. We need to brush up on this. We need to work on this. And then it's usually the instructor who tells you when you're ready, when he's got confidence in your competence yeah. and so i think we're using wo words like failure quite casually in a way that can be very discouraging at times i think and and it's actually about people learning so the disciples come to jesus one day and says you know why couldn't we cast out this demon and now you could label that failure or or not yet competent mm. not yet learned the required skills and prerequisites for achieving that goal and Jesus said, well, this kind of comes out by prayer and fasting. And so there was something that Jesus brought to the table that they didn't, but he wasn't keeping it from them. Mm -hmm. And their lack of success was not a disqualification for them being used in the future. So I think there's these two arenas, really. One is, is more about our character, our moral failure, and, and recognizing something's actually missing in our life until until we have an encounter with Jesus, until we find forgiveness and we find, you know, we encounter the new birth with the possibility then of, of character actually growing and developing and becoming strong and becoming all that, that God wants us to be with missteps along the way. Right. Um, and this other arena, which is more about, more about learning and gaining competence and improving skill, if you like, and that's another arena for me. And failure in that arena is is a very unhelpful term, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, this is funny. I think I quoted Ken Robinson in our last episode, but it, he also makes the point in the same TED talk that if what we know about kids, if if they're not willing to fail, then they will never create anything original. Yeah. And failure here is not, like you said, we're redefining what failure is or is not yet competent or needs to practice more. There was a really interesting study that was done, you'll find this interesting, by a uh, university professor. And uh, he was at a liberal arts college and uh, he was doing a pottery class. And so he split the classroom up in two and he told one class that in all you need to do in order to pass this class is I want you to make one perfect um, bars it has to be perfect as long as you make or as good as you can do it that's your assignment i want one by the end of the year and then he went to the other half of the class and he said this is how you're going to pass this class i want you to create as much volume as many pieces as you can possibly create over the year and when it came to the end of the year what they discovered was the people who had created volume created far more perfect vases than the people who were focused on creating one perfect vase yeah. which is sort of to this sort of idea that you're talking about that you know practice makes improvement yeah. that, that the people who are willing you could overcome talent with hard work and failure as it were time and time and time and time again and, and being willing to lean in 
yeah. uh, to that process that you actually create something yeah. you become a, a master of your craft yeah through that process well the other person who's in the top 10 of the ted talks is angela duckworth mm, grit grit she wrote a book and it's brilliant she talks about how when you marry passion and perseverance basically if you put those two things together you you become exceptional at what you do um and again it's it's the avoidance of the language of failure Mm -hmm. and, and we've we've grown up with that at school and so we become f we become people who want to avoid failure at all costs right right so so if you didn't get the the hundred percent you know if you didn't get the top mark um if you didn't pass this certain level you failed rather than you're not yet ready <laughs> well the, yeah that's the whole education system is predicated on that right totally. learn a body of knowledge if you can't regurgitate it perfectly, yeah. um, then you've failed. And and we can give you an exact percentage, by the way, <laughs> on how well you failed. <laughs> it's and, brutal. But, and, but then future opportunities are based off how well you can avoid failure in these exams. Yeah. And, you know, the Bible is full of people who failed, if you like, let's use that language. Um, but they made good. So the word of the Lord came a second time to Jonah. Mm. Um, you know, God has God comes to David and says, God has already put away your sin. You know, and then and he finds a new way forward. You know, and sometimes you can't un you, you, you can't undo the past and you're not meant to, but it doesn't mean there is no future. And I think people who experience failure in life, whether it's that you're fired from a job or you didn't pass that exam. Or well, you failed your driving test three times, you know. <laughs> um, you could say I failed, or you could say I didn't pass. Hmm. You know, and I think psychologically, there's there's a difference in terms of the impact that has on you hmm. and your motivation. Right, right. And I think that's the problem with the word failure. It it is incredibly disempowering and demotivating. Whereas not yet competent is empowering. It's like well, there's certain things you've done well, but you've, you've got to pay attention to these areas, not yet competent. And I've worked with people like that and nobody goes away feeling bad. Yeah. It's just, oh, okay, I can, I can do this again. You know, there's nothing worse. Like there are some things in life where um, a friend of mine who, who studied to be a doctor, he said, oh, I failed that exam. I've got two more chances. <laughs> And then that's it. It's right, like right. all of his learning is out the window because they're right. never going to give him another chance. And it's like, wow, why would we create a system like that? Why would we want a system like that? Mm. Now, why would we think three times only? That's 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 like baseball. Three strikes and you're out. Yeah. Yeah. It's like we're not playing a game here. This is life. Why can't it be that you do it a hundred times? Because if you eventually get there. Yeah. And and are they is the worry that statistically somebody's going to be idiotic enough to get it right at the hundredth time? I mean, <laughs> I'm just trying to think what's the thinking behind that. Sure. But I think in the church we've got to use language that avoids the language of failure. You know, unless it's a moral failure and that you know you have sinned. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, if we want to use biblical language, um, but most of the time we're not dealing with that. Most of the time we're dealing with sincere people making sincere efforts. Who just didn't get it right on that occasion mm. either because they weren't taught adequately or because they were in an arena where their knowledge is is being stretched out of the frame of reference that they're normally used to right right and and that happens often i think in ministry is is that the biggest piece of the puzzle for you people for people overcoming shortcomings is they have need a paradigm shift about what just happened. Yeah, they do. And uh, that's why I think mentors and coaches are so valuable. Mm, yeah. Um, you know, we were talking last night with the group there about the film Chariots of Fire, where Harold Abraham sits on a bench sulking because Eric Little has built, beat him in the 100 meter race. You know, and he says, I, uh, if, if I can't win, I won't run. And his girlfriend tells him, says, well, if you don't run, you can't win. And then the next scene is Samuel Masabusi, who is the professional coach, 
looks up at Harold Abrahams and he says, Mr. Abrahams, I can give you one yard. <laughs> and it's a magical moment in it's the brilliant. movie. Yeah. Because yeah. it says, he's basically saying this, I've watched you run and I know where your problem lies. Right. And I can increase your speed. And it's like that was such a moment of hope for mm. him. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, you know, he's sitting there and he said, I did my best. Yeah. And my best wasn't good enough. And now a coach comes along, a mentor comes along and says, I can give you one yard. And I think in the kingdom, we've got to have leaders like that with younger people who, who say, but I did my best. You say, well, that's okay. I know you did, but I can give you a yard. I, you know, I, <laughs> I can get more out of you. Yes, yeah. exactly. And that's what I think Jesus did when he says, uh, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. You aren't right now. Mm. But you, you keep with me and I will make you, you will learn the process that leads to that. Mm. Um, and, I, and, and I just love how hopeful that is. I love how empowering it is. And I, I love that nobody's ever disqualified in the kingdom until you disqualify yourself, actually. Mm -hmm. um, how do you disqualify yourself? Well, I think there's a couple of ways you disqualify. The, f the first is by giving up. I think that's the way, you, you know, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. You know, you just give up. Right. Um, John Mark disqualified himself on the first missionary journey. <laughs> yeah. He, he just gave up. But he had a coach and a mentor in Barnabas mm. who the next time around says, come with me, you know, we'll do this. Um, so I think you can disqualify yourself, but I, then I think you... You can disqualify yourself by giving up. Then I think you can disqualify yourself through um, through moral failure, through making some kind of compromise, and then something happens there, and your world falls apart, and then and then it's just got to be rebuilt. Mm -hmm. And then it's well, will you stay there? Will you, will you keep going down that road? And we were talking the other day, weren't we, when we were listening to John Mark Comer about how people hit a wall, and they either deconstruct and leave the faith or they deconstruct and then reconstruct the faith mm. and break through that that barrier and so that that's another area in which you can you can fail in that sense or you can disqualify yourself you can be disqualified yeah. so paul talks about this in first corinthians 9 he says i run in order to in order to win he said i i i box and i, I don't just punch the air and i bring my body in subjection so that I myself am not disqualified. And it's like he's, he's saying, I've embraced a set of personal disciplines and habits mm. to keep me on track. Sure. Because that way I can help others stay on track. Right. And I think, I think the worst thing is, you know, when we, when we lose that, that sense of uh, self-discipline that, that is needed to, to stay on track. I think I'm, I'm writing my third book now. It's called, it's called, um, images to live by. Okay. I'm not sure whether to call it to live by or to lead by because it, it's both really. Maybe I'll call it to live and lead by. <laughs> but in 1 Corinthians 2, Paul has a series of metaphors about leadership there. He talks about the farmer who's the first to partake of the fruit. He talks about the soldier who endures hardness. He talks about the workman not being ashamed. He talks about the vessel of honor. Mm. But one of the early ones he talks about is the athlete. And I've given a lot of time and attention to these different metaphors. And Paul says he, he doesn't win unless he competes according to the rules. And that's what I think, you know, when we talk about being disqualified. Well, when, when is an athlete disqualified? Well, you know, when he, when he doesn't play by the rules. Right, right, yeah. yeah. And, and so there's the famous Maradona goal where he put it in with his hand, but he didn't tell anybody. Yeah, you know, still won though. <laughs> <laughs> they still won. Still, when the, us English people are not better about that at all. <laughs> <laughs> the Argentinians thought it was brilliant. The English thought it was cheating. <laughs> well, it was cheating. <laughs> but, but, but you can't change the result. It's history. Right, right. Um, but that's what I mean about playing according to the rules. Um, and, and it's like, 
over, let me think now the exact number, I think it's around about 240 gold medals have been withdrawn from athletes because of they found out to be using enhancing drugs. Mm -hmm. And it's like not playing according to the rules. Right. Um, I've watched a snooker match where a player has turned around to the ref and said, I accidentally touched the ball and the ref didn't see it. And it's like he's he's being unbelievably sportsmanlike sure using integrity and so paul says he's talking to timothy there and he says look you've got to play by the rules and so i think there are certain rules in ministry um that are framed by the new testament things that we have to things like integrity things like transparency that we've got to we've got to build into our lives and into our ministries that help us win in life and in the kingdom. And, and that's really what we're talking about. What does success look like? Right. Well, it's, it, it has to be more than just numbers. It has to be more than just um, the look of the thing. There has to be something at the heart of it. Paul, to use his language in, 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 in 1 Corinthians 3, he says, unless you build with gold, silver, and precious stones... Um, it won't survive. If it's wood, hand stubble, it gets burned up. And then he's, again, I think he's using metaphor, gold, silver, and precious stones. Gold in the Bible always speaks of the glory of God. So he talks about that in 1 Corinthians 9, I think. Whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Silver always speaks of redemption. So the sockets at the base of the tabernacle were built of silver. The, the, uh, Joseph was sold for, for pieces of silver. Jesus was betrayed for silver. Um, the firstborn son was redeemed by a shekel of silver. So silver in the Bible is always speaking of redemption, that which buys back. And then precious stones. Well, the, the high priest had the precious stones, which represented the house of Israel, mm. the people of God. And so it seems to me Paul is saying, if you're going to build, build, do it in a way that brings glory to God, that is redemptive in its outcomes, mm -hmm. and that puts people first. It's got... You know, it's about people. So it's not about buildings. It's not about how many people who watch you on YouTube. You know, and I've got friends of mine who love to tell me, oh, do you know how many followers I've got on YouTube now? And I goes, well, I really don't care. Yeah. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> Good for you, sunshine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, does that really count at the end of the day? Sure. Yeah, you get to the pearly gates and Jesus goes, well yeah. done. You've got 100,000. Yes. <laughs> yeah. YouTube followers. Good on you. <laughs> Bravo, buddy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, it's like we've got to let success be defined in a biblical way, in a New Testament way, and focus on those aspects. Yeah, that, that's helpful because success can feel – it's easy to measure success in a running race. You come second, you didn't win. <laughs> 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 yes. You know, you were the fastest loser. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. <laughs> um, you know, in those settings, success, achieve, achievement of goals, whatever, failure, those are very easy to define. In, in the complexity of life, you know, it's much more difficult to have a metric for success for being a father or being a mother. Oh, I mean, wow. that's so much more nebulous. And, and how, and, and so... I'll tell you why it's nebulous. Because the ultimate judge of that is not in your hands right, right. you know the, the test of a good husband is well what what does the wife say yeah not how good you think you are yeah now you might have a sense based on the responses you get mm -hmm. um but it's like it's it, it's always amused me when you get couples sitting on a couch and there's a counselor and says how would you rate your marriage out of 10 and a guy never wants to go first. <laughs> <laughs> because because he's smart. <laughs> and whenever I've seen a guy go yeah. first, he'll go, oh, eight out of 10. Yeah. And they go to the wife, <laughs> five out of 10. It's like, oh. Yeah, there's a discrepancy here. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. happy, she's yeah. not. This, this is a trick question. I'm not playing. <laughs> Pass. Yeah. And there's that there's that scene, isn't there, in, in the in Mr. The and Mrs. Smith. Yeah. Yeah. With Brad and yeah. Angelina, and Angelina Jolie. Jolie. Yeah. And it's just really funny how they're on different ends of the couch and, and the yeah. issues they're going through. Oh, <laughs> I love that kind of stuff. So, so 
I mean, that's the problem. You know, am I a good pastor? Well, ask the congregation. Mm -hmm. You know, Paul says it like this. Uh, I know nothing against myself, but that's not what justifies me. Um, so in other words, I live with a clear conscience. Sure. But that doesn't mean I'm right. <laughs> More people lived with that sensibility, we would be a lot better off. Yeah. It's it's to the Lord that it each one will, will stand before the Lord and then each one will receive his praise from God. Right. And so so Paul has this understanding of himself. I know I need to keep my conscience clear because mm -hmm. I have to live with myself before God. Mm -hmm. That's called integrity. But just because my conscience is clear doesn't mean everything I'm doing is right and helpful. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that's why, you know, later on in life, he was so much more gracious towards John Mark. You know, he saw what he became. And I think he saw his own hardness. And, and lack of willingness to, to give the guy another chance, at least at that time. Right, right. And, but, and ends up by saying he's, he's profitable for the kingdom. Yeah, yeah, he commends him. Mm. You know, and he, Mark wrote a gospel. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I mean, sure. It's like, yeah. that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> it's not bad. <laughs> Sometimes I look at my life accomplishments and think, do more. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so this this whole failure success thing, it's tricky. It's tricky because, you know, who's who says you're a success and what's the criteria they're applying? And, and so in these intangibles, like, like being a father, like being a mother, it's, it's best to let them, s the other person, give you a rating. Mm -hmm. And if the, if the relationship is really good, Sometimes they'll point the way for it to be better. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. If, if yeah, it, that has so many factors dependent on that, you know, yeah. they have to be mature enough to be able to have the architecture to create language to, to help communicate. And, and so often, particularly with kids, they just don't have that. No. Um, it takes them a long time to, to get there, usually after many hours of therapy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is what I'm mad about. <laughs> 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 yeah um yeah and well it's yeah uh, it's actually true of course you know it's it's better defined by other people but but we still have to have a clear self-awareness of how we're how how am i succeeding in my own eyes mm. um you know what what is what is christian success in your mind what's a successful christian life <laughs> like 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 Giving my life over to Jesus, having correct beliefs, all of that is great. But, but you know, I think, I think there's a real nervousness to live this life out and to feel like you never even scratched the surface of your own potential. Mm. And, and kind of living somewhere within the tension of being at peace with yourself and walking slow and, 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 and um, having deep shalom and rest in who you are and your identity and this other piece of you that says, I need to do more, there's more to accomplish, I've got to strive to be better, I've got to accomplish more tasks, more people to meet, and, and living somewhere in between there and having the self-awareness to go, I've drifted over into unhealthy view of success versus a healthy view of success. I think we underestimate how much of our life is preparation. So Jesus begins his public ministry around about the age of 30. That's fairly astonishing mm -hmm. when you think about it. That's a long wait. Right, right. Uh, and his self-awareness of purpose comes around about the age of 12. By 12, he's articulate. Mm -hmm. So that's 18 more years. And then it's only three and a half years. You look at Joseph who sold into slavery at 17. He becomes a leader next to Pharaoh at the age of 30. So he, he takes the Egypt through the seven fat years. So, so, so he's 37 now. Mm -hmm. Then he meets his brothers two years later, 39. Mm. 
And it's not until the, the lean years that he's really coming into his own, that mm. all of the planning, all of the preparation, all of the stuff that's go, gone on before, they're now benefiting from as a nation and other nations are coming to them. Right. It would have been easy for anyone to be successful in those seven years of... Exactly. <laughs> But but he's using them not as a time to sit back and enjoy the prosperous years, but to save and to plan and to prepare during those prosperous years. And so I think we underestimate the preparation time that we need in order to fulfill the purpose of God for our lives. When Winston Churchill became prime minister, if you see the movie, particularly if you see the one, um, not the one with Gary Oldman, but the one with, with um, um, Gathering Storm, I think it's called. Um, he, there's a scene in there where Winston Churchill says, when I was a young boy, I knew that my country would be in grave danger and I would be there to deliver it. Mm, it was just so clear. Yeah, wow. his purpose from an early age. But he didn't. He didn't get there till sixty-five. Mm -hmm. But but they weren't sixty-five wasted years. Mm -hmm. And so David's time before he becomes king, you know, fifteen years of preparation before he becomes king, and then only one tribe, and then another seven years of proving the house of David exalting itself. You know, the house of Saul got weaker and weaker. The house of David got stronger and stronger. And then the other ten tribes acknowledge David. So he's 37, actually, when he comes into his kingship. Mm. And, and you sort of say to yourself, well, what, what is God doing in all that time? Well, he's shaping the man for his destiny, for his purpose. And then Moses, 40 years on the backside of the desert, you know. Yeah. So, so there are things that Moses tried to accomplish as a young man that he couldn't accomplish. Mm -hmm. It wasn't God's timing. And I think as I look back on my life, there were things – that I was exposed to and thought were opportunities, but but it was premature. I was not ready, uh, and and God was about getting me ready. And so I would say to people, be patient, be really patient. Everybody carries purpose and destiny. It's the overall comment on David's life was he served the purpose of God for his generation in Acts. Mm. And I think everybody's called to do that. But not everybody takes the time and the trouble to prepare for that so that when the moment comes, they don't even recognize it. <laughs> yeah. They don't even see it. Uh -huh. So Jesus weeps over Jerusalem in the Gospel of Luke. Oh, if only you had known the hour of your visitation. Mm. But now these things are hidden from you. And it's like a weeping moment for Jesus because there was a there was a moment there was an opportunity, but it was, but because of their hardness of heart, because of their reluctance, because they thought they'd already arrived. We are the people of God. We are the covenant people. We are the chosen ones. We are the blessed ones. Mm -hmm. Because of this all, this whole set of assumptions, and I think. Probably that's a great definition of failure, actually, is, yeah. is, is making a whole set of assumptions that are false. <laughs> <laughs> it's so hard, though, because we, we all have our blind spots, you know, like, again, how do we get to, how do we know in our own inter internal dialogue, what is a false assumption? How do we even know what our assumptions are? I find sometimes we don't even know what the assumption is until we think we failed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's, but, that's the moment to then reflect. What, you're right. What assumption did I make here? Yes, yeah, yeah. It's like, it's like when people say to me, I don't have any expectations. And I say, well, tell me about your disappointments because that will tell me about your unfulfilled expectations. Mm -hmm. And it's like a revelation to them. Mm. Oh, yeah, I was disappointed. Yeah, I did expect something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so we're not always good at articulating our expectations, but we're very good at articulating our disappointments because we feel it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, so we should be prepared in our life to spend more time in preparation yeah. than – because we all want to get on with being fruitful – but of course it takes years to get planted for it to grow 
You know, it's fascinating. Winston Churchill was um, asked to speak at an after-dinner event. And he said, how long do I have to speak? Uh, is it half an hour or five minutes? And they said, oh, it's only five minutes. And he said, oh, that will take much more time in preparation. Yeah, yeah. And I thought that was a fascinating answer. Mm. And I think it's true. You know, when I think of times where people have said to me, you've got five minutes to share a thought. And I'm thinking, this thought deserves a lecture. This thought deserves a conference. Sure. And you want me to do it in five minutes. But actually, you know, you can succinctly concentrate things down and at least share a nugget. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, there's that old saying, isn't there? Um, if I'd had more time, I would have written a shorter letter. Exactly. You know, and, and that's that's what poetry is. In many poetry is words at its most bare and its most honest and its most condensed form. Yeah. You know, that's why you spend so long unpacking one line. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it exactly. takes years to craft that. Exactly. So so the, the irony is that the shorter it was he spoke, the more time he spent on it. Because he knew every line had to count. Mm. Every line had to have impact. And I think life is a bit like that. I think we need to seize the moment and, and prepare ourselves. And we need to work on the two arenas. Who we are, our character, what are we becoming, and then our, our competence. What, what's the skill that we've got to really, really sharpen? So one of the things that I've often said to people in our church, look, if you're going to be a policeman, be a really good policeman. Yeah. If you're going to be a doctor, be a great doctor. You know, if you're going to be a teacher, be a teacher where people are enthralled to, to listen to you, not leaving your class saying, oh, God, that was boring. Mm. Don't just be somebody who passes on information. Be somebody who's creative in what you do. And I think, you know, I think that's why everybody loves watching Agatha Christie's Poirot. You know, he's just, the character is a creative thinker. Mm -hmm. and, and we love the way the story unfolds and the way he gets to who did it. And I realize it's just a, you know, a crime novel. But there's something about that and the excellence of it that we all admire. And I believe anybody can bring that... I've often said to people, look, mediocrity is okay on the road towards excellence. Mm -hmm. In other words, within the English system, I think it's around the world actually, you can do from grade one to grade eight playing piano. And each grade is, is defined, what you need to do, what you need to achieve, the standard you need to attain. And, it's, and, then, and then there's a, somebody who judges that and says, yeah, you've achieved finally grade eight. Well, just because you got to grade eight doesn't make you a concert pianist. Yeah, not even close. But it says something yeah, about yeah. your competence level. Right. And I think it's good for you to look at your life and what level of skill you are. And don't beat yourself up if you're a grade four, but, but like Angela Duckworth says, apply passion and perseverance to get to where you need to be. And keep pursuing it. Keep being a lifetime learner. Keep Keep looking at ways of doing it better. I mean, I've been preaching for 40 years, but I love listening to other preachers and just the way sometimes they unpack a truth. I think, oh, that was a really clever way of saying that. Mm. That was a really great way of framing that. Mm -hmm. uh, I always want to be someone who learns from others who are doing it creatively. Uh, and so I think having that attitude, and then I think the other thing I often say to young preachers is, listen to stand-up comedians. Yeah, yeah. Listen to the way they tell a story. Yeah, absolutely. And the way they circle back sometimes. I say this all the time. Yeah. Because the way they're able to, they, they put narrative around the story. And it's their observation. Totally. Like the you know, comedians are basically just observationists. Yeah. <laughs> if that's a word, if that would be, they just observe life and they're able to comment and then draw the funny thing out of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah I, I think it's Pete Holmes, you know, who says that, that um, comedians are modern day prophets because <laughs> they're willing to call out things lots of other people aren't. Yeah, and I, I think I agree with that. Um, you know, that's, and that's where as, as Christians and as leaders and as preachers and teachers, I think 
I think we need to take in from that and mm. learn some things. It's like, wow, that was actually really funny and really creative. We don't need to buy into their crudity at times right, or, right. or those other things. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, you separate out the chicken from the bones. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, there's some vulgar stuff that's unnecessary, <laughs> but but the, yeah, that the meat of it is is yeah. brilliant. Um, what what a what do you think is what do you think are the pitfalls of success? Uh, because failure is is kind of easy. We've talked about disqualification for failure or insecurity or a sense of inadequacy or whatever it is. Yeah. But I'm of the personal opinion. I think success is far more dangerous, potentially. Yeah, um, especially if you have success when you're young. Right. And here's the biggest pitfall: it's pride. It's it's like, you know who I am. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I did? Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Have you read the article? <laughs> Have you seen the numbers? Yeah. And and the danger with that Paul writes about this again in 1 Corinthians 3 when he says this phrase, "Who is Paul and who is Apollos? Ministering servants by whom you believed. I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase." And so I think Christians need to have a healthy dose of humility, especially when they're successful. And so I think when you look at David's life, you know, when he beat Goliath, he's taken into the king's palace. He's there probably for 10 years. He certainly can't become a soldier till he's 20. So he might be learning skills along the way, but he's basically the personal worship leader for, for King for Saul, Saul yeah. helping him deal with his issues. And his depression but then he becomes not only does he become a great soldier he becomes a leader of a thousand men fighting Saul's battles against Israel's enemies and you know he marries the king's daughter he's in the palace he leads a thousand men the king's son is his best friend it's like my life is sweet mm. And I'm 25. <laughs> it's like, and I am the next king right. of this this realm. And I was the runt of the litter. And yeah. I've done all this on my own back. Yeah. And it's like, and then it all turns to custard. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I do miss a good English phrase every now and again. <laughs> it's, it's custard. Sorry for you American listeners. <laughs> that means it went badly. <laughs> I could have used yeah. another phrase, but no, I didn't want to. That's helpful, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's like, oh my gosh, he ends up in a cave losing everything, losing his wife, losing his status, losing his income, losing his reputation, all because of a song. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which he didn't so, even write. Song was clear as thousands, David is tens of thousands. Yeah. yeah. And so the next probably five years of his life, um, He's on the run with 3,000 men who are told you'll get a bonus if you kill him. And it's like, wow, that's, that's a heavy thing to handle. And I think, I think God is using that season of hardship to work humility deeply into the life of David. There's things that success give you but humility isn't one of them <laughs> <laughs> dang it <laughs> yeah pain and hardship does that uh -huh. Uh -huh. and and life is painful and you know if anybody tells you you can do what you want and be what you want they're not telling you the truth mm. I, I think that's a that's a very unhelpful lie. I, I think you'll have certain options. You'll have certain opportunities. They will open up to you, but it'll be hard. Whatever you do, it'll be hard. And uh, you're going to go to college. You're going to have to study. That's hard. You know, you're going to you're going to work in a certain field as a Christian. Uh, it's going to be hard. It's like Desmond Doss, who you know, where the movie Hacksaw Ridge, yeah, where yeah. he didn't want to pick up a gun, and everyone interpreted that as cowardice, mm. you know. And then he saves, I think it's ninety three, 
It's a phenomenal movie if you haven't seen it. Go yeah, watch no, it. He saves. He got the Congressional Medal of Honor. And the man who called him a coward, his captain, wept at the end and said he was the bravest man I ever met in my life. Mm. And it's like he, he redefined bravery. Mm -hmm. And for him, bravery was not running when there was gunfire and soldiers were falling injured. It was running into the gunfire and rescuing them mm -hmm. and pulling them out. Yeah. And it's like, oh, my gosh. Well, people will always try and define your own motives for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. David's older brother tried to do that with him. Yeah, yeah. I know you. I know you, the pride of your heart. Mm. It's like, yeah, you're just projecting right now, big bro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, you know, sometimes... <clears throat> When life feels like it's going wrong, like it did for Joseph, like it did for David, like it did for Job, uh, when life feels like it's going wrong and in your heart you say, I don't know what I did. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I think that's the time to just s look to God and say, look, um, help me grow and learn in this place of pain. Mm-hmm. And let me position myself to be humble in this. You know, God, I, I was talking to a church leader who's who's been repositioned by his senior leader. He doesn't want to be, but he has been repositioned. And I said, well, what's your big issue? And he says, well, I think he's wrong. I said, so he's wrong and you're right. And he said, yeah. And I said, okay, does that sound like a humble posture to you? Mm. And I said, well, what, what if that's true? What do you think God is looking for from you here? And I said, if you position yourself to be humble, you position yourself to receive grace. God gives grace to the humble. He resists the proud. I don't want God resisting me because I know I'm not going to win. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, the only person I want to resist is the devil. But, but, but I don't want to resist the Lord. And the only way I know to do that you know, Isaiah 66, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. Where is the place that you build for me? All these things my hands have made. But to this one will I look, to him who's of a broken and a contrite heart, who trembles at my word. Mm. And it's like, oh, wow. So, so God lives in two places. The transcendent God, where heaven is his throne, and the God who dwells with the humble, contrite man who trembles at his word. It's like, it's like, okay, then I want to be that man. Yeah. I want to position my heart to just walk in humility. And if I'm walking through a valley, I want to keep walking. If, if it's the cross, I want to endure it because there's a joy set before me. And, and I, I think success for me is fulfilling the purpose of God that he's given you for your generation. And, and that will take preparation time way more than you ever realize. Right, yeah. Humility, yeah, it's, it's tough, isn't it, how failure will humiliate you, but, but bring you into a greater place of wholeness as well. Yeah. Jesus makes the point, doesn't he? You know, he looks at two men at the temple with the disciples there, and one's a Pharisee and the other one is a man who's saying, I'm a sinner, beating himself on the chest. Yeah. You know, he said, it's this man who's, who's found found salvation yeah he's gone away righteous yeah he's righteous i mean that right living yeah it's because what you know that's sort of the essence of righteousness is to to align right living and, and so jesus there's a model there displayed for us of of posturing ourselves in humility yeah 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 i started leading a church of 80 people when i was about 30 years of age and then by 36 it was a church of 500 so it was, it was a lot of success and a lot of great things happened, but also a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have the maturity or experience to handle them. I just, I just wasn't what it needed. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Even yeah. though I had the responsibility. Yeah. And boy, did I feel a failure walking away from that. <laughs> well, but, but success has a way of covering over so many issues. Yeah. 
you know, look at a successful, you can pick on, we can pick on pastors if we have to have a, you know, have a mega church from an early age. But of course, you scratch beneath the surface on the top of it, it all looks like success and amazing, but you only have to realize how much dysfunctionality. Well, that's the thing, you know, um, growth in and of itself is okay. But a garden left to itself will grow, mm -hmm. but it will be wild. Yeah. And the thing about the Garden of Eden was it was cultivated. Yeah. I think that's what church leadership is all about. Antioch was a church that was never planted by an apostle. It was spontaneous. It was persecuted believers from Acts 8.1 who went north and shared the gospel with non-Jews because nobody told them they couldn't. <laughs> and so there's this spontaneous church at Antioch of Jews and Gentiles living together, loving each other, loving Jesus, but with very little leadership, actually, it seems, because the apostles send Barnabas to see what's going on. And Barnabas looks at it, and he does what I think is the most subversive act in the entire New Testament. He doesn't go back to Jerusalem. And I, my reading is he knew they'd kill it. Mm. And so he goes north to Tarsus to get Paul. And he has to search for him. He's in the city. I mean, he has to search and find Paul. And he brings him back to Antioch. And it says they taught the disciples for a whole year. What were they doing? Cultivating. Mm -hmm. They were giving shape to a wild garden. Right. In other words, there was growth. Mm -hmm. But growth that's simply growth without cultivation is just wild. Right, right. And, and so I think church leadership is about giving shape to churches. Yeah. I, well, the mistake is we define success as just growth rather than success as health. Yeah, um, exactly. You know, within, within the church. We've, you know, if, we, if you focus on health on a plant, the plant will grow. Yes. Um, and, uh, but, but it's just amazing how we use success or perceived success as a way to sort of um, uh, coat over all of the things that are going wrong. We're, we're happy to ignore all the dysfunctionalities and, and just use some sort of metric of success as a way to go, yeah, but look, God is blessing this. Yeah. And that's more, that says more about the grace of God than mm. it does about you. Right, yeah. yeah. As, a, as a quote unquote successful leader. Yeah. So I think, you know, we've got to be careful that we don't use worldly metrics when, when talking about success. Mm -hmm. Because often worldly metrics will lead to self destruction in the very process of creating success. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, it's like the, the billionaire who just is unhappy, miserable, the Howard Hughes who won't let anybody meet with him and wash his 10 times a day and, you know, ends up being a little bit freaky and bizarre. Yeah. Even though <laughs> by many other metrics, he's highly successful. Uh -huh. it's, it's like we don't want to become casualties on the road towards success. We, we want success to be defined in the way that Jesus would define success, mm. which is faithfulness and loyalty to him and, mm -hmm. and obedience to what he's asked us to do. Mm -hmm. I find it fascinating the way John 21 ends. Like you read the end of John 20 and you think that's the end of the book. And then lo and behold, there's another chapter. You know, um, all these things are written that you might believe and having believed you have life in his name. What a great way to end a book. And then get John 21. And John 21 is so weird because... You know, Jesus says to Peter, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted to go, but when you're older, another will lead you. And that's a little bit oblique. Mm -hmm. So John says, it's like John, John leaves us in know that. This he said signifying what death he would glorify God. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. You know, that's written, that John writes that. Yeah. And Jesus says that, and John says, just want to give you the interpretation <laughs> here as a prophetic guy. And Peter's response is, well, what about him? <laughs> 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 have, you got a, 
<laughs> and you got to work for him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is this worse than mine? <laughs> and Jesus yeah. says, what if I want him to stay till I come? What's that got to do with you? Yeah. Follow thou me. Right, which is Jesus' way of saying none of your business. Totally. And then we find out, and, and I've often pon pondered, why did Jesus say that to Peter? You know, why did he say how he's going to, how he's going to die um and we know from church history he, you know he was crucified upside down and i i think my take is this peter had such a cataclysmic moral failure when he denied jesus three times because because when he's talking with jesus in luke 21 i think it is where jesus says oh um, simon simon satan has desired to have you and, and Peter turns around and he said, Jesus, I'm ready to die for you. And he says, okay, well, before the clock has, clock has crowed yeah. twice, you'll have denied me three times. Yeah. That's Jesus' response to Peter's. And I think when Peter went out, wept bitterly, and then when he was with Jesus, you know, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? I think Peter came to terms with the fact, I thought I loved you more than I did. I thought I would die for you and I didn't. I denied you. Mm. And I think when Jesus says, when you were young, you did this and you did that, but when you're older, I think what he's really doing is putting hope in Peter and saying, you remember that day you said you'd die for me? You're going to get there. Mm -hmm. mm. You will. That's your success. Yeah, yeah. The very thing you desired to do you will achieve right it'll just come later than you think yeah 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 you just need to keep going on the road and you'll right. mature more and you'll get there yeah and i i actually think that prophecy is a prophecy of hope for peter mm -hmm. and that's what i love about it yeah that's brilliant do, do you find now that Success when you're young, I think in your 20s, so many people are going, getting after it, get on the grind. You know, people want to appear successful. Of course they do. I think that's a very natural human emotion. But typically in life, you, everyone goes through hard things. Nobody gets a free pass on suffering. Um, whatever it is, you know, be it your, your bankruptcy or your divorce or sickness or health or lose someone close to you grief betrayal all of these things that, that we go through in life coming through it on the other side d is success sweeter as you get older uh, like in the sense that you don't need it as much but it's really fun to have <laughs> that's a great question that's a great question i think what you do is because you redefine success when you're older, it is sweeter. So let me give you an example of this. Um, John writes in his epistle, he says, I have no greater joy than to know that my children walk in the truth. Mm. That's what you're talking about. Right. So for him, success was not what he'd accomplished, but, but the legacy he left yeah. that he saw being lived out. And he looked at that, and I think he was joyful. And that's when you say, does it get sweeter? It does, because you've learned to redefine what success looks like. Mm. And so it's less about you and your ego, and it's more about the legacy and what you've been able to reproduce and leave behind and see grow. Mm. And that's where the real joy comes. Yeah, the impact and the transformation that your finger has been a part of. Yeah, and I think that's what parenting's all about. Right. I, I think real parenting is not about you making a mark that your kids then have to live up to. <laughs> <laughs> but it's about you making a mark in a way that puts an imprint on them that they joyfully embrace and go and do better and go further. For me, that's certainly my desire. That's certainly my joy. Yeah. And so I, I, I think in that sense, it is sweeter when you get older. Yeah. I think it is. I think it's very ego-driven when you're younger. And, and, and that's the real danger of it. Um, there was a guy, <laughs> he had the largest church in Europe, quite a young guy, and he wrote a book. 
called Ministry Without Tears. Somebody showed it to me. They said, well, he's got a few lessons to learn. <laughs> <laughs> he obviously... Yeah, he obviously read Jesus' <laughs> biography. <laughs> yeah, and he, he, he missed Acts 20 when Paul is talking to the Ephesian elders. Or, or Jesus wept. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, sure yeah. enough, the guy, you know, like, within three or four years, hit a wall. Right, right. You know, and I think he's written another book now. <laughs> <laughs> the Weeping like, Leader? <laughs> but it's like, yeah. um, I was talking to a friend of mine who's in Holland. He's built a great church in Holland. And there's a guy there who's well-respected in the nation, who's been writing since his 20s. And now he's in his 70s. And he's rewriting all the books he wrote in his 20s. <laughs> he, said, he said, I don't know why anyone bought those books. <laughs> That's, I've always wanted to ask authors that question. That's the problem with writing something down is it becomes so static information. Totally. That 60 years later, you're like, I've got some new ideas on this. Yeah. <laughs> I've got some involved thinking on these points. Yeah, and yeah. that's that's why I quite like revised revised editions. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. because because life is dynamic and it yeah. does change. And some books are written for certain seasons. Mm -hmm. You know, and they have an impact, and that's great. Mm. But other times, it's like you're writing out of your knowledge and understanding that is incomplete. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Again, so. not a not a failure, just not yet competent. <laughs> <laughs> On the journey, <laughs> my school reports were could try harder. Could try harder. Oh god, <laughs> every single one <laughs> must pay attention. <laughs> it's easily distracting. Yeah, sports is just so much yeah. more fun. <laughs> like in my day, they hadn't diagnosed ADHD. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That wasn't a thing we could have. That wasn't an option. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much, Dad. Uh, Pastor Peter Prothero, acknowledge your office and your wisdom. And uh, I hope that was really helpful for, um, for you guys watching. We thank you so much for tuning in to this podcast. Make sure to give it a like and subscribe to the show. And uh, aside from that, I pray that you have a blessed week. We hope that this in some way enriched your life. God bless.